Welcome to my talk, Device Trees in Zephyr, Navigating Hardware Diversity. My name is Stefan Kratochwil. I'm a software engineer for Embedded Systems. I have a background in real-time operating systems and embedded Linux, software architecture and heterogeneous systems. I want to talk a bit about diversity in embedded platforms. We will have a brief look into how embedded platforms have evolved over the last years, what implications this has on software portability, how device trees are used to tackle software portability problems, how they are implemented in Zephyr, and I will show you a little showcase we developed here at Innovex. If you look back, then we see that microcontrollers uh, originally were pretty small, had one CPU, a little bit of RAM, and a few peripherals. Shortly after, applications became a little bit more complex, and our platform became a bit larger. CPUs became larger, became more features, and we also got more RAM. And also, we see we got additional types of peripherals. What has been a green hexagon previously is now a yellow hexagon. It's still a hexagon, but has a different color, so it needs a little bit of a different treatment. And if you look how things evolved, then after some time we have more than one CPU in our SOCs. We have different RAM sizes, variety of our peripherals became even larger, and today we stand uh, at platforms that have multiple CPUs of different sizes, sometimes also different types. We have peripherals that contain peripherals, and suddenly also our RAM comes in different colors. If we think about what an operating system wants to know after a power on reset, then there are three main questions that have to be answered before we can start with doing something actual meaningful. First question, where am I? Second question, where are all the peripherals for the operating system located and where are the drivers the operating system needs to initialize? And if we think back in different code bases we all may have seen in the past, then we all know that these questions are traditionally hard-coded in systems. We have a more or less complex application that shall be put onto a hardware platform. And as an abstraction between the hardware platform and the application, we have some sort of hardware abstraction. But we all know that these types of hardware abstractions are not always as abstract as they should be. Most of the hardware abstractions we know already carry some sort of details of the underlying peripherals within them. And this creates issues in terms of portability. If our application becomes a bit more complex after some time, then we have to move the application and maybe also our hardware abstraction to a new platform. But because the hardware abstraction we previously had already has some details of the underlying peripherals, this no longer matches with the hardware and the peripherals of the new platform. We have a massive portability problem, which can only be tackled by a massive amount of time and work. How does Zephyr tackle this problem? Zephyr makes use of a data structure which is called the device tree. A device tree is a textual representation of a hardware platform, and as you may already know, it is, for example, used in the Linux kernel, and all of you who have enabled or disabled a Bluetooth interface on a Raspberry Pi probably already got in contact with the device tree. It is also used in one of the most widely spread bootloaders, U-Boot, and also Zephyr makes use of the device tree. Now, if we look at this 
small device tree example. Then we see it contains information about which CPUs do we have in our processor, which peripherals do we have in the SOC, and where these peripherals are located, and what the name of the driver is that should be loaded such that peripheral can be used. So this already answers the first two and a half questions we stated before. The where am I question, in this case a Cortex-M4 CPU. Where are the peripherals? Here, this is the address of this particular UART. But the answer to the question, where are my drivers, is only partly given. Device trees in Zephyr work a little bit different than they do under Linux. Under Linux, device trees are loaded dynamically during boot time. And the Linux kernel, for example, can decide what to do if a driver is not being found. This type of failure is not an option in an embedded system, and for this reason, we need device tree bindings. Let me briefly explain how the device tree bindings and device tree sources fit together. Let's begin with the device tree sources. These come in DTS files, and these DTS files contain the device structure. The DTSI files can be included from DTS files, and these allow for some sort of generalization between different device families. If individual properties within the device tree shall be changed or modified, the device tree overlay comes into play. And now we have a textual data structure which basically has no semantics yet. This is the task of the device tree bindings, which come in YAML files. A device tree binding proposes a requirement on a device tree node. It, for example, specifies that a device tree node has to have a mandatory property, otherwise it would be an invalid device tree and would lead to a compilation error. Over here, we see that device tree sources and device tree bindings are used during the code generation process of CMake to generate a device tree underscore generated dot h source file. This source file, or this header file, is used in the device tree dot h file, which is already part of Zephyr. And by taking this detour, the Zephyr kernel and the Zephyr device driver and probably also the applications that run under Zephyr, can make use of all the different properties that are configured in the device tree. Now let's jump to the showcase we implemented here at Innovex. At Innovex, we implemented a little device called the InnoCube. It is a small cube with a few sensors and a few interfaces. And because we like hardware, we also decided that it shall blink. For this reason, we put a single RGB LED into the EnoCube, and this LED is of type WS2812. Now we need two types of drivers to configure and use this LED. The first driver is the interface driver we need to talk to the LED, and the second driver is for the LED itself. Luckily, Zephyr already has both of these drivers available. Zephyr also brings device tree bindings that are required for this use case. If you look over here, the device tree binding for the WS2812 LED strip comes with a property which defines that a device tree node for this LED shall have a chain length property, which must be of type int, and it is required to be there. If we do not define the chain length in our device tree node, then the compilation will fail. If we look into the driver code for this LED strip, then 
we see that we have also the option to define the length of the strip during runtime. Down here, we see the definition of the LED API update RGB function pointer. And the function behind that takes a, uh, takes a parameter number of pixels. So in essence, there are two options. We can either define the length of our LED chain in the device tree node itself, or we can also get this value during runtime from a user property, for example. Now, what decision did we make in the end? As you can see over there, this is an actual picture of our InnoCube. You see that the LED, this one over here, is directly soldered to the PCB, and there's no way for the user to attach, for example, a longer LED strip. This makes the length of the LED strip a hardware property. It is not changeable. The length of the LED strip is one, and because it's not changeable, we put it into device tree. If it would be a user-modifiable property, for example, if there would be a jack, and you could plug in a longer LED strip, then it would be user-configurable, and then this property, the chain length, should not go to the device tree. In the end, the device tree node for our WS2812 LED looks like this. It is defined here, and it has a chain length, a fixed chain length of one, which is hard-coded during configuration time. This concludes my talk. Thanks for your attention.